Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation in memory of Richard Hefner, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Angelson Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Joan Gantz Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. A Mayor's Life is our guest, former New York City Mayor David Dinkins' new memoir, an in-depth, candid portrait of his fascinating political career. I see New York as a gorgeous mosaic of race and religious faith, of national origin and sexual orientation, Dinkins writes. Mayors come and mayors go, but the city must endure. Longtime urban affairs correspondent Sam Roberts of The New York Times called the book Required Reading for New York City's new mayor, Bill de Blasio, a moving memoir by an upwardly mobile son of the city, and a timely reminder that liberals seem to get elected in New York just as the city is running out of money. Nonetheless, always statesmanlike, calm, cool, and collected, Mayor Dinkins relates his governing temperament and the obstacles he faced to recent political struggles of President Obama. While the past six years have marked a decline in unemployment, the American people sometimes indicate their lack of confidence in what they perceive as President Obama's passive approach to policymaking. While crime actually slowed during the Dinkins administration, opponents of the mayor accused him of inaction. Explaining defeat in a rematch against Mayor Giuliani, Dinkins said, I think it was pure racism. In light of his comment, I first want to ask Mayor Dinkins if his personal composure, that coolness, has always been innate or if he was afraid as mayor of displaying emotion because of a fear of an electorate's racism, that being an outspoken black man, a black mayor, would fit in with the stereotype. Mayor, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you. Uh, and the, the legacy goes on. <laughs> so how about that? I'm talking about your legacy. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate you saying that, Mayor. Well, I... Uh, one of the th reasons for writing the book, and I really owe that very much to Len Riggio, the CEO of Barnes & Noble. Um, he didn't publish it, but he's a, a very good friend, and without his support and encouragement, and there would have been no book. And he wrote the preface. Right? Yes, yeah, he, he's, he's a terrific guy. He, uh, and he just loved Bill Lynch. Bill Lynch was the guy who really got me elected. He was the, the New York Times called him the Rumpel Genius, and he was uh, my chief of staff when I was Manhattan Borough President, and a deputy mayor when when I f finally got elected. And uh, it was it was Bill Lynch, uh, I, I think more than any other single person, who helped us do a lot of the things that we did. Although one of the reasons for writing the book was to make the point that no principal, no governor, no mayor, no president gets anything done alone. It, it, and it's the quality of the people with whom you surround yourself that makes the difference. And I had the good fortune of having had a lot of friends, some who worked with us and some who did not. Uh, for instance, uh, there's Peter Johnson, Wall Street lawyer, young fellow, uh, and I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm of counsel to the law firm now, uh, uh, Leahy and Johnson. And it was Peter who on election night in 1993, and we had lost, people were very upset. As a matter of fact, early that day, election day, we had a press conference in City Hall to point out that people in Brooklyn were complaining about white off-duty police officers who were questioning the people waiting in line to vote. 
with questions such as, have you ever been arrested? Do you have a driver's license? Things that are totally irrelevant to whether or not they were qualified to vote. <coughs> so we had a press conference uh, to, to point that out. So people were very angry. But the, the uh, eager supporters are always angry when you lose. And they demand a recount and things of that sort. So Peter Johnson said, no, Dave, we, we really should, uh, we should be statesmen. And so uh, uh, some of the language you use in your intro, uh, we said in this country we don't have coups and revolutions, we have elections. And the people have spoken. The mayors come and mayors go, but the city must endure. I was a real statesman. Next morning I looked at my bride of now 61 years and uh, I looked at her and I said, you know what? We've got less than 60 days to get out of Gracie Mansion, find a place to live, a means to pay the rent, and simultaneously transition an entire government in a professional, responsible way. Lest they say, see, you let those people in and look what they did. So her job was to find us a place to live. And uh, the Rudins are good friends. In fact, Lou Rudin, uh, I, I spoke at his funeral. We were that close. So she went to Lou, and Lou showed us some apartments, and we ended up on uh, East 68th Street. And, uh, and the rent's paid for this month at least. So we'll, we'll be there. But it, it uh, thanks to Peter, uh, I think we behaved as we should have. And um, uh, in fact, Peter said to me, well, why don't you think about teaching at Columbia? Because Peter's a Columbia graduate and Columbia Law School. Brilliant fellow, he really is. And um, so I said, well, I haven't practiced law since 1975. He said, no, SEPA. I said, what's SEPA? SEPA is the School of International and Public Affairs. So in literally two days, by two days I mean 48 hours, we met with the president of the university, the dean of the school, and I just sat there with my mouth hanging open and Peter said things like, well, he's a former mayor, he's got to have an office. The former mayor's got to make at least this much. <laughs> well, I'm not. So I, I'm, I'm still there and I love it. The, the young people though, they're graduate students, they're a whole lot smarter than I am, but uh, it gives you hope for the future. Uh, they, they really are terrific. Uh, many from outside the city and, and outside the country, but they're, they're good. But as far as your personality, friendly, on an even keel, equanimity, is that, was that innate? Because your, your mayoralty certainly proved to pave the foundational steps upon which Mayor Giuliani could build in, in several different realms, but your own personality, is that, is that coolness something that no one could dispossess from you under whatever circumstance? Well, I don't know that I'm so cool. <laughs> I don't know that I'm so cool, but uh, uh, I, I just I am who I am. And uh, I used to say to our, our staff, uh, and they're really good people, women and men. Uh, oh man, I was so fortunate uh, to have been able to select uh, a, a fine staff. Many of them uh, suggested to me by people like Bill Lynch and Basil Patterson and Percy Sutton, and some some of whom, some of the people who went to work for us, I didn't know before. Uh, some I met in the borough president's office and and later in, in the mayor's office. But I, I used to say to them, I'll take your advice 95% of the time perhaps, but you must understand that the Lincoln rule obtains. And they say, what's the Lincoln rule? I said, well, Abe Lincoln would convene his cabinet and he'd put a question and then take a vote and go, Nay, 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 nay. Lincoln would say the eyes have it. <laughs> so, so they understood that. But uh, I can think of uh, 
uh, instances, like take needle exchange. That's where the government gives free needles to drug addicts. And when I first heard this, I said, you better be kidding. And, and they said, in effect, sit down, Mayor, and listen. And uh, it took a couple of weeks, but they explained to me that, one, we would decrease the spread of AIDS because uh, contaminated needles was what was helping that. Plus, a small percentage, maybe only 1%, 2%, would, because of the, the free needles, would get introduction to uh, uh, drug programs, and some of them would get off of drugs. So uh, today it's accepted as a, a good and wise thing to do. But that, I cite that as an extreme example of uh, something that they persuaded me to. We have wonderful people. And Basil Patterson, and I'm just getting to the point now where I can talk about Basil without getting overly emotional. But he was a part of me, he was a dear friend and law partner. and. Uh, but Basil was the chair of our Judiciary Committee. It's a non-paying position, but he would uh, vet and recommend uh, from his committee persons who would go to the bench, uh, become judges. And the mayor gets to appoint criminal court and family court judges, which as we have observed, uh, not that it's so profound, but for many people, that court is a court of last resort. So in that sense, it's very, very important. We, we think of uh, the appellate courts and the, the Supreme Court of the United States, obviously important. But for many people, for who knows, millions over time, that family court or criminal court is really the court of last resort. So Basil brought me such good people that if I had, say, one opening, he'd bring me three. It didn't matter which one I picked because each was good. And so we are proud of our record of having appointed more women, more minorities, more gays to the bench than any other administration. It was easier, in effect, for Mayor Giuliani to demagogue. I mean, that, that's what you're getting at. And to be outspoken, to be adamant, to be publicly angry over an issue like crime, when race is added to that, it's a different story. Ray Kelly at the time was the first deputy commissioner, Lee Brown, or Dr. Lee Patrick Brown, as I love to call him. He was my commissioner. And uh, they did a study of the New York City Police Department. They gave me a report that was like a phone book. And because uh, we wanted to tackle the problem, but let's, let's understand what it is. And there had not been such a study in a quarter century or more. So we, we decided that what was important was, uh, one, we needed more resources. And not just more police officers, but all the related areas. Um, if you have more police officers, you need more assistant DAs. You need more defense counselors and legal aid society. You need more pe people in probation and parole and so forth. Plus, the, the report that they rendered for our program, which was called Safe Street, Safe City, uh, was subtitled Cops and Kids, because we recognized how important it was to provide means for young people to have uh, other things to do besides antisocial behavior. And so we, we devised this, what we call beacon schools, where Schools would be open beyond the hours, the usual hours of instruction, uh, and with programs paid for by the city, but designed by the community, and it worked very well. To this day, they still have Beacon schools. I thought Rudy would change the name, but he didn't. Now, but to get the resources for this, we had to tax ourselves. And as you probably know, the city does not have the capacity, other than real estate rates, the tax itself, you have to go to Albany. So, uh, led by Milt Marlin. Continues to be an issue with it, which it the current mayor has to grapple, who was one of your staffers. That's true. Well, Milt Marlin uh, was a distinguished, is a very distinguished 
person. He was the presiding justice of the appellate division in the second department. He too stepped down from that job to become a deputy mayor with me. Well, he was in the vanguard of the effort in Albany. And one day, a white state senator from Queens, a Republican, when we said people are dying in the streets, he said, to Mr. Mayor, my constituency is concerned with auto theft and graffiti. I mean, it was that kind of rough, but we won. We, 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 what it was was a surcharge on personal income tax, and, uh, which we thought was reasonable, but we had to guarantee an actual uh, letter or memorandum of understanding that we would not use these resources for the general treasury, use it for the purposes that, for which uh, uh, we sought this tax in the first place. So th that's what helped us. And as early as 1991, crime started to go down. But when people speak about crime today, as they write about it, they'll speak of crime in the 90s. Well, I took office January 1st, 1990. So they write about it as though on December 31st, 1989, there was no crime. Just the next day when Dinkins became mayor. So it was a little hard to get used to that. But so they, they, they don't write the crime of the late 80s, although they recognize that that was the crack epidemic. A lot of bad things were going on in that time. But it didn't start the day we took office. Let me explore with you the foundational revitalization that was underway under, under your tenure, Times Square. That began as your project, well, and I'm wondering, as you look at mayors who've succeeded you. I can't let the moment pass without telling you about Times Square. Sure. On the very last day that we were in office in 1993, December, I don't know whether it was the 30th or 29th or what, whatever the last day was, I mean, where I'm going to lock the city hall door and hand Rudy the key. I mean, that late in the game, a fellow named Carl Weisbrod came dashing into city hall with a memorandum of understanding to be signed by Barry Sullivan, who was a, a real good guy, is a real good guy. I got him from David Rockefeller. He's a Republican, but he was the, the deputy mayor for finance and economic development. And that deal started, it was the Disney deal that started the revitalization of Times Square. Now, this is what Carl Weisbrod was doing at the very last minute. You or I, I'm sure, at that late stage would have been out circulating our resumes. Got to get a job. Not Carl. He was still on the case. Incidentally, he was a co-chair of de Blasio's transition committee and, and now has agreed to come back into government, and he's the chairman of the City Planning Commission. So I'm sure he's taken a cut in money to do that, but he's a terrific guy. These are the kinds of people that I had the good fortune of having uh, work with us. What aspect of the city is, is in most need of revitalization? Well, I, I, the education and jobs, of course, are way up. But this is not to suggest that we, after eight years of Rudy and 12 years of Mike Bloomberg, this is not to suggest that they didn't do anything in these areas, uh, because that would be unfair and inaccurate. But uh, a budget, as Dr. Esther Fuchs of Columbia University loves to remind us, a budget is a political document in that it orders one's priorities. Mm -hmm. And perhaps if over the last 20 years uh, resources have been expended in a different direction, some of these problems that we have today might not exist. Now, this is without assigning blame to Rudy or to Mike. I'm, I'm not doing that because uh, it's always easy to Monday morning quarterback. But in terms of how we got to the severe income inequality, the priorities or the misplaced yeah, well, priorities led to that point. Yeah, well, this is what de Blasio ran on. You know, he came out of the pack to, to become uh, 
the mayor. In fact, my candidate had been Billy Thompson, who who was uh, an old friend and who ran the uh, Board of Education when we had a different system. Uh, but Bill de Blasio uh, successfully argued that this is the tale of two cities. And, and indeed, in many ways it is. There are some of us who are privileged to have our children attend uh, better schools because this is where we live in those neighborhoods. And uh, uh, with respect to uh, jobs uh, or, or unemployment, homelessness, if, if one has but to read uh, David Jones, who's the head of the Community Service Society, and by way of full disclosure, I'm a lifetime trustee uh, but David uh, annually writes about these kinds of things, as, as does uh, uh, Marion Wright Edelman, the Children's Defense Fund, not only on New York, but in, in general. And they point out that uh, minority children have a lesser chance of living beyond X years and so forth. And, and uh, we, we, we are... Uh, um, less, uh, we are, people are less concerned with us than they ought be. Uh, I mean, this is what is, it, uh, it must be the case because look where we are. But see, also I should, I should point out that I'm a product of uh, the Depression years. I was born in 1927. So I tell people I'm old. They say, what do you mean you're old? I said, well, if you're <laughs> closer to 90 than you are to 80, you're old. And uh, I'm 87. That's a lot. Uh, but I, I was in the United States Marine Corps in 1945 uh, at a time when uh, Tuskegee Airmen, as Dr. Roscoe Brown is, and black soldiers and black Marines were treated less well in the South than were German and Italian prisoners of war. Now, how illogical is that? That's just bigotry. It's racism. And, uh, but things are better now, and they're not what they need to be, but as we say, thank God, they're not what they used to be. What's your mindset towards how we can achieve greater equality? Are there aspects of reform from your administration that you would put back to work or new inventions that have not even been experimented with in city government yet? Well, well, well first off, I would point out, I have never ever argued that I was the smartest guy in the room, as some of my political friends uh, seem to adopt that posture, uh, not I. Um, I would, the advice that I would give Bill de Blasio is to surround himself with bright, young and not so young women and men to advise him in these areas. I, I, would, I would not, there's one, there's only one thing that I can think of that I have told him that I favor, and I, and I said this publicly, <coughs> pardon me, uh, I suggested to him as, as he sought the revenue to do some of the things he wanted to do. And I said, you ought to look at the commuter tax, so-called. This is an income tax on people who work in the city but reside outside the city. As mayor, we, saw, we had such a tax. And as mayor, I sought to increase it unsuccessfully. Mike Bloomberg, one term, one year, sought to, to get that and he was not able to. It, it had been eliminated by the state legislature. It's a, another long story that goes with that, but I think it was a big, big mistake. And, and it, the tax on these non-residents isn't the same rate that we residents pay, uh, but it is not unfair. They use our services. And what are you gonna get mad and say, I will quit my job in the city? This is, this is not like some things that we concern ourselves about in the tax areas where we say, well, people will leave the city, they'll take their jobs and go away, the factories will move. 
this is not such a, a situation. But, uh, and Mike fought very hard, uh, Mayor Bloomberg fought very hard to get the congestion pricing, which would have yielded, I think, about $300 million from the federal government one time. And this commuter tax is four to $500 million each year, depending, obviously, on where you put the rates. We're running out of time, Mayor, but I do want to ask you, as I did in the opening, do you see parallels between your own political career and that of President Obama in terms of the blowback as a result of, of being a black politician in an executive function? To some degree, yes. As a matter of fact, I say to people that being mayor of the city of New York is the greatest job in the world if you like public service and you like people, as, as I do, and that uh, is being mayor of New York is better than being mayor of any city anywhere in the world better than being governor of any state, including New York State. And the only job that's better is the one Obama has. But of late, I begin to wonder about that. <laughs> because they, he, he's, he's re really getting beat up on a lot. Uh, and I think in many instances in an unfair fashion. Mayor, thank you so much for being here today. I wish you continued success. Thank you. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other Open Mind interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation in memory of Richard Hefner, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Angelson Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Joan Gantz Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.